travel is one of the most spiritual things we do, whether it's about sort of where we're going or how we're getting there. Um, so how can we meet the new challenges uh, of travel in this sort of current COVID and post-COVID world with uh, advances in technology? So what do smart devices have to do with travel? Um, so I think that the Internet of Things in particular can make travel less foreign and more familiar. Um, I think the same kind of comforts that we imagine for ourselves at home, customizable light settings, you know, a thermostat that automatically adjusts to the temperature that you like. Um, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't be able to bring those things with us on the road someday um, so that when you go somewhere, it feels a little bit more familiar. Um, I also think that things like checking in, especially to homestays, can be a really high friction experience, um, especially with regards to key handoff. Um, I remember once I was staying at a homestay in Brooklyn and I had to meet somebody in midtown Manhattan in order to pick up the keys at some point in the afternoon. Um, and these places were about an hour apart. It was incredibly inconvenient. And if this is a friction for me, it's probably a friction for a lot of people uh, as well. I think that this also represents a huge um, opportunity for hoteliers and property managers to glean a lot more information from their guests um, in ways that can improve the guest experience. So for instance, if you're a large hotel with multiple lobbies, finding out which ones are more popular based on you know, who's there, uh, the Wi-Fi signal traffic at the time. And I think one, you know, an interesting thing that could be done with the Internet of Things and smart devices would be, you know, if you have a tendency to set all the temperatures in your building uh, at a certain level, basically, uh, you know, maybe we could learn that people generally like the temperature lower. And so maybe we could set it to an energy saving uh, level. Um, but I think there are a lot of challenges with the Internet of Things. I think um, new tech equals new headaches. Uh, there are a lot of sort of privacy concerns with regards to smart devices. It's kind of uh, it means more surveillance. It means um, more entry points uh, for attacks or uh, security risks. And I think a, a really big challenge also is can we make sense of all the data? Um, I think this is something that a few people have mentioned before, but like data formats, are these things interoperable? Like, is the metadata that's generated by a Hue light bulb the same as an IKEA light bulb? Uh, I, I, I doubt it, but, um, you know, and can we zoom out from there and actually sort of gain insights from these mountains of information that are going to be generated from all these things. But I'd like to move on to sort of like my main discussion point, which is more about the, the fourth industrial revolution. So it could be advanced. Um, so how else is technology changing? So uh, I think, you know, Mark touched on this uh, with, with the advances in things like AWS uh, and all the all the tooling <laughs> across the uh, across the whole technology ecosystem. Machine learning is becoming more available and easier to use. Um, distributed computing is becoming cheaper, cheaper and, and easier than ever. Um, cloud services are becoming the norm, whether you're aware of it or not. You know, when you take pictures on your phone, you're probably uploading things to the cloud. Um, there are more and better open source tools now. Uh, there are whole companies built on open source, and they open source what they produce. Um, and collaboration tools are advancing rapidly. I mean, this platform that we're using right now is uh, something that didn't exist a few years ago. So this is a huge advance as well. Um, and I think that technology is actually catching up somewhat to the scale and complexity of geo problems. Um, even without a good spatial database, you can throw a bunch of computing cores at something and solve really heavy problems like distance calculations from you know a data set with a million things to another data set with a few million things, stuff that was really unheard of on a, on a lone computer. Um, we have cheap storage in the cloud, which means that we can do things like copy uh, the entirety of OpenStreetMap and put it in some uh, database. And faster computers in general mean that we have access to better and more interactive visualizations than we ever had before. Things like Kepler GL, um, Tableau visualizations, ArcMap, Mapbox, Google Maps is now sort of a 3D vector. Um, like our computers wouldn't have been able to handle these things a decade ago. Uh, and really the advances in you know miniaturization and, and speed in our computers really help these things along. Um, and machine learning, of course, can take advantage of all these things as well. But I think here comes my controversial statement. Um, I don't know if you've heard this before, uh, this phrase, spatial is special. I think that we need to make spatial normal, not special. Because um, I think at a certain point, unlocking the value of geo is less about tools and more about culture. Um, I think that if, uh, I think that an organization needs to be aware that it can ask geo questions maybe this isn't a problem with something like a geospatial focused company where you know geo's in the name um, but a business where uh you know it's not entirely 
<laughs> it's not entirely clear that everything that you do has a location uh, component, they might not be asking those questions. Is the organization aware of the technologies that it has at its, at its disposal uh, or, the, or the, the resources in terms of people? Um, are these tools documented? Is this knowledge being shared? And I think a really key point is, are subject matter experts acting as gatekeepers or evangelists? Uh, so I think we need to democratize geo. Um, so this is an example of a virtuous cycle. I think for a lot of uh, analysis and product development, and the way that we do business um, and solve problems, I think typically people ask questions. We develop solutions, either methods or technology. Uh, we generate insights, and those insights help us to ask new questions. And I think that we tend to focus a lot um, as sort of an industry geo. We, we, we like to talk about sort of cool new tech and how it's advancing. So I think we, we think a lot about solutions, um, methods, and technology. Um, and next slide, please. I don't think we focus enough maybe here on the asking questions part. Um, now, maybe this doesn't apply to everybody in this in this presentation right now, but I think with regards to private industry, uh, maybe we don't ask enough questions. And I don't know that that's the fault of most people. Um, I think that as subject matter experts, we need to bridge the gap between ourselves and users, people who could really take advantage of this information. Um, and I, here's my idea for a sort of idealized virtuous cycle. Um, I think that domain experts need to, if they are acting as gatekeepers, need to sort of break down that gate and really become evangelists for geo within an organization um, by sharing their knowledge, um, giving examples of what's possible, by training people, upskilling people, and hopefully sort of bootstrapping or kickstarting the virtuous cycle. And I think that could really help um, create a paradigm shift in an organization where maybe the technology isn't the blocker, but the lack of knowledge of what's possible is. Uh, next slide, please. So to kind of sum, geo is a journey. And I think as domain experts and technologists and really geo, uh, geo people, we need to meet users where they are. Thank you.